So, all right, where were we? We are starting at this point right here. I am taking my x vector, which is 0, 0, 6, 8 in terms of the standard form. The first two are my non-basic variables, and these are my basic variables. It was easy to pinpoint to the solution directly because under the basic variables, these are my slack variables over here, and under them, I had the identity columns. Right? So if you look, you can take your B matrix as your identity, S1 and S2 are your basic variables, no problem. I added to that my Z value as another basic variable. This is without loss of generality, and I'm going to treat my Z variable as just like another basic variable. And I'm going to ask the question, okay, you're going to M neighbor only. You have the option of moving from zero to something higher, one of the non-basic variables. Should you choose X1 or X2 to move from zero upwards? Okay. All right, and then we looked at our objective. Our objective was X1 plus three X2 in row zero format, Z minus X1 minus three X2. This has the higher potential, so we said that X2 is to be made higher. Okay, so I am going to move to a neighbor. I currently have zero. I currently have zero, zero, six, eight. X1, X2, S1, S2, and my Z. This is my current solution at hand, I, and I can pinpoint to it in my canonical form without any problem. And I said that I am going to make X2 as high as possible. Per unit, I have gains in my Z objective, and I would like to make it as high as possible but I cannot make it too high because I will be leaving the feasible region, right? So X2 higher means that I am going in this region and I shouldn't be going off the feasible region. Okay, so I asked what is the highest value that X2 can take. Now, what are my restrictions? When I do this change, X2 is going to move up, but X1, is going to stay at zero. Only one non-basic variable is going to exchange its row. This one, I don't know how high, but it will go to some positive value. And these ones will decrease. Okay, so I'm going to ask how much can I make X2 higher such that one of these values drops to zero. Only one of them. So I had a zero. I will make one of the others which were positive equal to zero, and the two zeros will exchange their roles, all right? That's why I'm finding the extreme highest possible value that X2 can take onwards. Okay, so to do that, I have to look at my system of equations. And let me rewrite that system of equations here, if you like, so I have Rewriting z minus x1 minus 3x2 equals to 0. x1 plus x2 plus s1 equals 6. Minus x1 plus 2x2 plus s2 equals to 8. Okay? Now, I said that x2 will go up. I also said that x1 will remain at 0, right? So x1, I can forget about it. It's not in the picture. Per unit of x2, the canonical representation helps me because I see no basic variables in my zero other than the z. I don't see the s1 and s2. I will see exactly the net effect of per unit increase in x2. And this is very important. If I had s1 and s2 also appear in here, if x2 goes up, s1 can go down or up. I won't be able to see the net change in my right-hand side. But right now, I know exactly because I will only pick one of the non-basic variables, and the basic variables do not appear in my canonical form representation. Does it make sense? Okay, so I have x2 if it goes up, s1 will go down. x2 if it goes up, s2 will also go down. I cannot leave non-negativity. Remember, I will always keep in mind that I have non-negative. So I need to ensure that both S1 and S2 remain non-negative. S1 is simply 6 minus X2. S2 is what? 8 minus 2X2. 
and I need to enforce that they're not negative. Which tells me that x2 cannot be higher than how much? So that's the system of equations after x1 drops down to zero, right? And as x2 goes up, both s1 and s2 will change. Ensuring non-negativity, I have two restrictions. x2 cannot exceed six, and x2 cannot exceed four. All right? But if x2 is five, for example, what will happen? If x2 is five, s2 will become a negative value. So I should choose the bottleneck, and this is known as the ratio test. You will see what are the ratios we are considering in just a sec. Does it make sense? Why we cannot exceed four? And it's obvious actually in this graph, we are here, we are moving to some positive values of x2, right? x2 positive, what is the highest value? x2 equals to four is the highest value over here. Sounds good? Once x2 equals to four, go back to your system of equations, plug in x2 equals to four, what will happen? S1 will be two, plug in S2 equals to four, what will happen? S2 will be zero. So actually, indeed, you will move from the corner point, which was zero, zero, six, eight. Where would you move? Zero, zero, six, eight. You made your X2 equals to four, X1 remained as zero, and S1 has changed to value two, and S2 has changed to value zero. And that's exactly my point B in this graph. Does it make sense? What is the objective function value of this new solution? It was zero here. This was z equals to zero. What is the z value here? Per unit of x2, we chose x2, y, because per unit it incremented my objective by three. We said that x2 can go as high as four, so the new z value should be 12. Thank you. Okay, and if you plug into your objective, this new vector, zero, four, instead of zero, zero, you will get exactly that z will be equal to 12. Does that make sense? Okay, so the net change will be the per unit change. You chose x2 because per unit change was three units. And you said, what is the highest point? That's four. So three times four, that's the net change in your objective function. Okay, this is your new vector. And you will ask the same question. Is this the best one? Or can I find in a neighborhood? Anything better in the neighborhood? Okay, Oktai had a very good question uh, during the break. Now, I am only looking at my neighbors, right? This is a very, very limited form of a search. Simplex method currently is at a point, looks at the neighborhood, and if there is nothing better in my neighborhood, I declare myself as the optimal solution. This is a very simple, very greedy logic, but this greedy logic guarantees that you will be able to find the optimal solution wherever it is. So it's enough that you're only better than your neighbors to declare yourself as the optimal one. Local optimality ends up in global optimality in simplex. Local optimal, local meaning that I'm only better than my neighborhood, is the same as global one. And this is all because of convexity. Okay, if you are ever in doubt in this, uh, in, in your IE, experience, in Bidkant IE experience, if you want to make your professors happy somehow, just bring in the word convexity somewhere in the conversation, it will get you to wonders. So 
you should of course pack it up a little bit, but convexity always helps. Convexity is a big deal and it's, it's the reason of everything why we can solve LPs so effectively. So it's a very simple logic. I only look at the neighbor, look at the neighbor and I say, okay, this is the best one among neighbors, but who's guaranteeing that there is nobody out there which is far away, which is better, and that's convexity, okay? All right, so. That was a slight uh, backtrack. All right, so where were we? Now I have this new solution. I have B, and I need my canonical form representation for this new solution. Why do I need this? Because it's all because of the canonical form representation that I was able to say, okay, X2 should go to this value, and it will get you to something better than where you are currently at. So again, what was the representation that we asked? Canonical representation. Every row should have a single unique basic variable. So it was Z before, S1 and S2, but now what happened? X2 is now one of the basic variables and S2 is no longer one of the basic variables, all right? I have the exchange taking place between X2 and S2. So X2 will be my answering variable, and S2 will be my leaving variable. And I need my tableau, my canonical form representation, which will take care of this. I will see instead of S2 over here, I don't want to see S2 as the basic variable, I want to see X2 as my basic variable. Does it make sense? Good, okay, all right. So in short, what did we do? How did we find that number four and number six? Why is the name ratio test? We're basically, what we're doing is that we're taking the right-hand side, we're taking the right-hand side in the ratio test, which is six, and dividing it by the coefficient of the entering variable. X2 was the entering variable, right? I don't have to look at X1 because it's going to remain as non-basic. I only see the change with respect to X2, what will happen to the basic variable S1 and what will happen to the basic variable S2, okay? So I took basically six and divided by the coefficient of the entering variable, which is one. And in the second one, I took eight and divided by the coefficient of the answering variable, which is two. And that's where the ratio test is coming from. Okay, so if you look at what we did numerically, these were the equations. I needed to guarantee that S1 and S2 remain non-negative. These were the numbers that I came up with but it's equivalent with taking the ratio of the right-hand side, dividing by the coefficient of the answering variable. All right, makes sense? That's why we have the ratio test. Now, if it was so that I had, instead of x2, I had minus 2x2 here. What would change in my ratio test? I will have minus 2x2 plus s2 equals to 8, or s2 equals to 8 plus 2x2. In other words, no matter how high you make x2, s2 will remain non-negative, okay? So in other words, the ratio test is only for the coefficients of the answering variable, x2 in this case, which are positive in the equations, all right? If they're negative, it means that no matter how high you make them, it won't have any potential of forcing the basic variable in question to negativity, all right? Okay, so, all right, so X2, we chose our ratio test. This is our ratio test, right-hand side of the basic variable divided by the coefficient of the answering variable. That's how high you can force it without forcing the basic variable to go negative. That's my ratio test. So exactly what we did over here and got to x2 equals to 4. 
Now I want X2 and S2 columns to exchange. So that I have the canonical form representation, right? X2 entered, S2 left, but I want X2 to look like it is part of the basis in the new canonical form representation. Okay, in other words, I don't like this coefficient of two. What do I want? I want it to look like S2 coefficient, which is one, right? So I want to see coefficient one here. I want to see coefficient zero, coefficient zero, like it was for my S2, because S2 and X2 are gonna exchange roles. Yes? So what does it mean in terms of linear algebra? You're sort of kicking x2 from every equation that it appears with a non-zero coefficient. That's what you want, right? You want zeros for x2. And that's where pivoting comes into the picture. So you want to make this equal to one, you do elementary row operations such that that coefficient brings down to one. You want to make this coefficient equal to zero, you do a proper multiple of one equation added to the other equation such that uh, you get the zero over there. Does it make sense? So in other words, what we're basically doing is, so I have this representation, I have z minus x1 minus 3x2 equals to zero. I have x1, x2, s1 equals to six, 2x2, s2 equals to eight. That's my system, right? From here, I take out my x2. I take out x2. x2 is the same as, what is it? 8 plus x1 minus s2 divided by 2. Correct? That's the same equation. I take this representation of x2, plug it in over here and plug it in into the objective function. That will get you exactly to a representation in which x2 variable disappears in the objective function, disappears in row one, and comes into row two with only unit coefficient, just like s2 was before. Does it make sense? Okay, and that simple pivoting that you're all familiar with. In other words, you're gonna have this entering variable x2, leaving variable s2, and this is going to be your pivot element. You're gonna do elementary row operations to pivot around that element. So what you'll do is you divide through with two, that whole row, to get the one coefficient for x2. Where is it? To make x2 a basic variable in this equation, just like s2 was, I need to divide through with two and get the plus one coefficient over here. If I do that, of, because of animations, I think uh, you have lots of uh, unnecessary pages in the PDF, sorry about that. Okay, so to make x2 has a coefficient of one in row two, I multiply this whole row with one and a half, right? To make x2 coefficient here disappear, exactly what I did on the right hand side, eliminate x2 in each of the equations, in elementary row operations, it's the same as multiplying this row with minus one and adding it to row one. Make sense? So that I get the zero that I want over here. To get the minus three equals to zero, what can I do? I can multiply, now that I have my one here on the pivot element, I can multiply it with three and add it to the objective row. All right, so you can ensure that these steps are doing exactly what you want and get to the form in which x2, as we like, appears alone nowhere else in the other two rows. Everything has changed and now this is an equivalent representation of the same original ax equals to b form, but now I have my canonical representation for my current solution, right? I know that my current basic variables, what are my basic variables? Which ones are my basic variables? It's S1 and X2 now, right? 
So that's my basic. That's another basic. So this is basic, basic. And Z is always basic with value 12. And the other ones are non-basic. OK, so whatever I don't see here, these are only my basic variables. Whatever I don't see here, I will know they're non-basic. And they have values equal to 0. And now if you get rid of your non-basic variables, your x1 and s2, so if you just drop these columns because they are equal to 0, you see that the z value currently is 12. S1, which is one of the basic variables, has value 2. And x2 has value equal to 4. This is exactly the canonical form representation for your current new solution, which is this point B over here. Make sense? Why are we doing this? Again, why are we doing this? Why did we bother changing to all this, doing all these elementary row operations? How good is that? Why could I do this if I had both basic and non-basic variables appearing in my objective? This is, this is a very crucial thing to understand. That's the heart of the simplex method, why we're bothering. That's exactly the steps of the simplex method. It does nothing else. It just translates everything to the canonical form because it's helping me dictate exactly whether I sh there exists a neighbor which is better or not, okay? Now, I can only go to a neighbor by moving one of the zeros to something higher. If I had both basic and non-basic variables in my objective, now, in my objective, I have two components. There are the coefficients of the basic variables, there is the coefficient of the non-basic variables, all right? I am going to pick one of these non-basic variables and move from zero to something positive, okay? But in the meantime, the basic variables are gonna change, right? They're going to drop their values to something because of this change. If the basic variables also appear in my objective function, there will be increments in the non-basic portion, decrements in the basic portion. I won't be able to see what's the net effect on Z. But if I don't have any of the basic variables, only non-basic variables in my objective, since I'm only going to increment one of them, I will see the net effect directly in my objective function. All right. Remember, we had z equals to x1 plus 3x2. Both of them were non-basic in the previous iteration. I did not have s1 in my objective. I did not have s2 in my objective. All right. If I had s1 and s2, I wouldn't be able to say guaranteed that per unit of x2, your objective increment is equal to 3. All right? Because s1 will also change. You could have, for example, 6s1, 7s2 here, and you won't know the net effect from just incrementing x2. So it's very, very crucial that we don't have any one of the basic variables in my objective function. And that's exactly what the canonical form representation is providing us. And now we translated everything so that we have the canonical form representation of this new solution, because I will ask the same thing. Currently, you have x1 and s2 as your non-basic variables. Is any one of them going to improve your objective if you make it a basic variable? Okay? And for that, where do you look? You look at your objective. You see that only s1, x1 and s2 appears, not the basic one. Since you're going to be picking one of them, you see the net effect. Per unit of x1, change my objective increments by 2.5, which is nice. Per unit of S2, it increments by, it decrements, right? So S2 is not eligible to enter, X1 is, and per unit of X1 change, I'm going to have better objective function value. So I improved from zero to 12, I ask, is it improvable? So I am right here. Can I make it a little bit better than 12 is the question. OK, any questions? 
Okay, so I can, right? X1 can be incremented. So now X1 is going to be the entering variable. And I am going to have to do the ratio test again, right? If X1 increments, the current non-basic variable S2 is going to remain at zero. But if X1 increments, it will drop S1, which is basic. It will drop also X2, which is basic. All right? So what is the highest possible value that X1 can take without leaving the feasible region? So I am at this point. I am going to make X1 higher. What is the highest possible value that I can make? So I am at this point. I'm going to make X1 higher. What is the highest possible value that one hurt won't take me out of the feasible region? All right, make sense? What is that value you think? With the ratio test, you do exactly, you take the right-hand side, divide by the coefficient of the entering variable if this variable value is positive. Okay, and the second one, this one, is not going to be effective because it's a negative value. So let's see, this is my system of equations. Where am I? Page of that. Okay. Yes, here we are. So, okay, I'm looking at my equation number one that's over here. I cannot move x1 higher than 4 over 3, otherwise, I will go negative for s1. And I cannot make x1 greater than or equal to minus eight, but X1 has to be non-negative anyway, so this is not going to enter into the ratio test. So if I do my ratio test over here in a simple form, I take the coefficient of the right-hand side, divide it by the coefficient of the entering variable, which is 1.5 here, but this one, because it's negative, there is no finite ratio here. Does it make sense? So the highest possible value is 4 thirds, and indeed you will also see it from the picture that X1 will have the highest possible value of 4 thirds, which is actually the optimal solution to come. Sounds good? Okay, so if X1 is equal to 4 thirds, what will happen? S1 will drop down to zero, so the exchange is indeed happening between X1 and S1, right? So that's going to be my entering variable, and now it's going to replace my S1 variable, which is my basic variable. Sounds good? Okay, and this is the new point if you plug in for X1 equals to 4 thirds, X2 becomes this much using this system of equations, S1 and S2 drop down to zero, and this is what happens to the objective function. 46 over 3, much better than the 12 value, okay? So let's see whether we can grab this solution from the tableau as well. I want a representation which will take me to the solution, so I will see whether it's improvable or not. And to do that, I do my pivoting operations, right? That's my answering variable. S1 is your leaving variable. What do you need? You need to have the S1 column and the X1 column exchange favors, right? So I need to see one here, I need to see zero here, I need to see zero there, all right? Okay, and to do that, I need to do a lot of pivoting. I need to divide through with 1.5. After you do that, you add a proper multiple to the other rows. You can make it look like S1 column very easily using elementary row operations. This is clear, right, for everybody? I'm not going through the elementary row operations, but I guess it's clear. Yes? Okay, so if you do that, what do you expect to see over here? That's my new solution. Entering variable X1 is going to exchange roles with S1. So over here, I want to see the value of X, X1, I'm sorry, which is 4 thirds. 
Over here, I will see the value of x2, which is 14 over 3. And over here, I should see the value of the current z, which is 46 over 3. All right. If you get to the proper canonical form, your z value as well as your current values of the basic variables, which is this vector, should exactly tell you the specific values that you found out. Make sense? So that's another check for you. You know how much the objective should improve. It's per unit times the number of units coming from the ratio test you should see whether it actually improved that much or not as a check. Sounds good? So if we do that, I am going to skip lots of steps, but here you see at every step what is exactly happening, how should you multiply which row, add it to which row, and so on. You get exactly to the form in which x1 has underneath the identity column. It does not appear anywhere else, but in the equation in which it is basic. Okay, and now I ask the same question. Is this canonical form improvable? Can I improve the current solution? And here the answer is no. We have hit the optimal one because I know now that the current non-basic variables, which are S1 and S2, if any one of them goes up from zero to something higher, I will have 46 over three drop down to something lower, okay? Because the coefficients here are positive in regular form, they will be negative on the right-hand side. Sounds good? So now I declare this as my optimal solution, okay? All right, and that's basically it with the simplex method. Now, a shorthand representation is a simplex tableau, and this is what we will be using after we know exactly what happened in the dictionary long representation form of the equations. So instead of writing at every time x1, x2, and so on in all the equations, just write down as headings in a tableau, and just look at and write down the coefficients in the equations. All right, it's just a shorthand notation. It's saying the exact same information. There is a zero, there is an S1, and S2 also here, and I have appended my column names as the variable names. And what are my basic variables in this representation? They're simply the ones in which I have identity columns underneath. Z, as always, S1 and S2 are my starting basic variables, okay? Uh, okay. All right, so let's see what we have done in this Tableau format in summary. So that was given to me, that was my starting basic feasible solution. Right, point A, I have S1 and S2 as my basic variables. These are my non-basic variables. I look at which variable, which non-basic variable is eligible to enter. Both X1 and X2 are eligible to enter because they have negative coefficients. They will improve my maximization objective. But I chose the one which has the highest potential of improving, which is X2. If I choose X1, what would happen as my answering variable? Instead of x2, if I chose x1 as my initial entering variable. Is that wrong, you think? It will still improve, but it won't improve as much as x2 because I have my z as x1 plus 3x2, right? But still, it has a positive contribution to the objective. So if I chose x1 as my answering variable, instead of going to point B over here, I would be actually going to neighbor D over here. So you should do that as an exercise. Choose x1 as the answering variable instead of x2, which is fine. As long as I have a positive contribution to my objective, I can choose it as my answering variable. So choose that one and see whether you will arrive also in this direction to the same optimal solution. <laughs> Bless you. Good? 
Okay, but we chose X2 because we were greedy, right? X2 with did our ratio test. Ratio test tells me, look at the entering column and take the right-hand side, divide by the coefficient of the entering variable, which is one. Take the right-hand side, eight, divide by the coefficient of the entering variable, which is two. And the minimum here was equal to four. So exiting variable is going to be my X2, S2 variable. So X2 entered. S2 left, in my next iteration, I do elementary row operations such that that column looks exactly the column it is replacing, which is S2. So I divide through with two in order to get the one here, and then after I get the one, I make this equal to zero, I make this equal to zero. Sounds good? You do your elementary row operations, and after lots of steps that I just said, with animations, uh, this is exactly what you get, all right? So this is the B representation, point B representation, or canonical form. And now I ask the same question, what are the basic variables? X1 and X2, these are my basic variables. X1 and S2, these are non-basic. Should I choose any one of the non-basic variables and make positive, and the one having a negative coefficient, X1, is the only one eligible to enter? Okay, so we were at B, we chose X1 to enter, and that got us to this highest possible point, and the representation here is this one. Good? And we cannot iterate anymore because I look at the coefficients and they are all positive. Make sense? So the, we declare this as the optimal one. And in summary, let's see what we have done. We have first converted it to standard form. This was no big deal. We found somehow an initial starting basic feasible solution. This is going to be a problem. We're going to deal with this uh, on Thursday. How? should we start if we don't have a ready-made starting basic feasible solution? So here it was easy, why? Because we had all less than or equal to constraints, we added slacks, and slacks were our initial starting basic variables, right? So it was because I had the zero vector as a feasible solution to the less than or equal to form. It might not be the case, but if I have a feasible solution, I will choose the entering variable as one of the non-basic ones that improves my objective, hopefully the highest, and then I do my ratio test and see which one it is going to replace. The whole vector change, I need to represent the new solution, and the tableau have the new solution representation, so I do my pivoting operation, this is very important, and it tells you after the pivoting what exactly is happening to which row so that you can't miss it uh, as an algorithm. Does it make sense? Okay, and I have to, <coughs> of course, <coughs> repeat until I come to a point like this in which I can declare it as the optimal solution. Okay, so a preview for next time. We have dealt with max problems, right? What happens if I have minimization? What happens? Can I solve min problems in a similar manner? Think about this before next time. And in the graphical solution, I have seen different cases, right? I have seen cases in which I had infeasibility. I have seen alternative optimal. I have seen aboundedness. How do we recover those cases using the simplex method? Okay, because now I won't be able to see that I can improve indefinitely. I have to see it somehow through algebra that I'm improving indefinitely. So think about these before coming next time. Degeneracy is a big problem, is actually what's making simplex not the nicest possible algorithm, it's stalling simplex. And these two are to form initial solutions if I don't cheat and give you the system with less than or equal to four. All right? Okay. All right, see you then, thank you.